The pirate's life was all about risk and reward. The stakes were unbelievably high at the height of the Golden Age as the British Navy clamped down on pirates that refused the King's pardon. Pirates who were successful could potentially walk away from their crimes as rich men and women, but those who were caught red-handed faced the horrors of execution as dock. That is, execution as dock is in the physical place in London, England, reserved for the hanging of some of the world's most notorious pirates. Over the course of 400 years, from 1430 to 1830, many of the most famous pirates of the Golden Age and beyond were hung, gibbeted, and disposed of in the waters surrounding this eerie London port. Many were lost to the depths of history, but the names of some live on. Today, we will be taking a look at the history and usage of Executioner's Dock. We will meet some of the notorious pirates who were executed at the gallows here, and we're going to explore what it was like to live around the area at the time the Golden Age was in full swing. Sit back and relax as we take you on a tour through time to explore the grisly reality of Executioner's Dock, the final resting place of some of the most terrifying pirates ever to sail the Seven Seas. The History of Executioner's Dock The grim tale of Executioner's Dock can be traced back to around 1430, when the Admiralty Courts, the British courts with control over laws of the sea, maritime trade, and the navy, set up the dock as a way of executing and deterring would-be pirates, marauders, or plunderers. The dock consisted of a scaffold, eventually turned into a functional gallows, situated just beyond the low tide mark of the River Thames, at the point where it flowed into the North Sea. The dock is located in the East London district of Wapping, which sits on the river's north bank. The British Admiralty Court's policy stated that any British person who had committed crimes that fell under their jurisdiction could be brought back to London to be hung and displayed at Executioner's Dock, regardless of where they were caught in the world. So, this meant that any pirate of British origin could be captured in the Caribbean, Africa, South America, or beyond, and if found guilty, would be guaranteed a terrifying death at Executioner's Dock. It wasn't any pirate who was hanged for their crimes, however, but specifically ones whose acts of piracy resulted in the death of an innocent person. Pirate captains were a top prize for the executioners here, but many members of their crew, providing they had not committed murder, were typically given custodial sentences instead of capital punishment. That being said, the majority of the individuals who were hung at Executioner's Dock were indeed pirates. Executioner's Dock's last hanging were those of George Davis and William Watts, two pirates that were sentenced to hang for their part in the Cyprus Mutiny. They were accused of having taken control of a British penal ship bound for Van Diemen's Land, a penal colony. They took the ship to China and posed as castaways. They were eventually caught and found themselves at the mercy of the London hangman. The two pirates met their grisly end on the 16th of December 1830. Following this, the gallows were eventually dismantled and no further executions took place at this site. This may have had something to do with the gradual decline in piracy of British origin in the centuries following the end of the Golden Age. A Typical Execution at the Dark As is the case with any historical torture method, punishment, or execution, a death at the hands of the lawman at Executioner's Dock was a particularly terrifying one, filled with suspense, waiting, dread, and vile conditions. The majority of the individuals sentenced to hang at Executioner's Dock were pirates arrested or defeated in battles somewhere out on the Atlantic Ocean throughout the Golden Age of Piracy. Pirates came in from the Caribbean, the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America, and the coastal waters of the eastern United States of America. Upon their capture, the pirates would typically be sent to the nearest governor, usually a British lawman or military senior who presided over an island, county, or general area. The governor would see to it that the pirate was securely held until a ship arrived to take them back to London, where they could stand trial. Upon being returned to England, the pirate would typically await trial in either Marshall Sea or Newgate prisons, two notorious decommissioned institutions that had held some of the country's biggest criminals since medieval times. Upon standing trial, the pirate, if convicted, would quickly be sentenced to death. There was only one way out for a pirate at this point, and it wasn't pleasant. The condemned would then be returned to the prison from which they came, able to do nothing but wait out a terrifying and grisly death. This process could take up two months at a time, a process that must have been harrowing and nerve-wracking for the individuals awaiting their doom. When the big day finally arrived, the High Court Marshal would arrive to inform the pirate that this was it, their last day on Earth. In a horse-drawn cart, the High Court Marshal would drive the condemned around London on display for the public to see. As the public jeered and observed this spectacle, the High Court Marshal would march ahead grasping a silver oar, representing his authority over the sea and all those who would seek to commit crimes on it. 
The procession would march across London Bridge, past the Tower of London, where so many men and women prior had been executed, and onwards to Wapping, where executioner's dock awaited. At this point, when Wapping beckoned, the condemned pirate would be joined by a chaplain who would stress the importance of the pirate repenting for their sins and confessing before God so they could be granted his mercy at the gates of heaven. On the way to the gallows, it was customary for the condemned to be permitted a drink, usually a quart of ale, at a tavern a short ride away from Wapping. Whether or not all condemned pirates took this offer is unknown, but it is highly likely that many of them stopped for one last drink. Execution days were busy. When the news spread that a notorious pirate would be hanged at Executioner's Dock, the streets of Wapping would be lined with spectators and hecklers, both individuals who wanted to see the pirate hang and those who were just there to observe a piece of history. While London's residents gathered on the streets, it was customary for those who owned boats to take to the waters off the coast of Wapping to get a better, less crowded view of the ordeal. The sounds and sights of these days must have been an assault on the senses. From here, the condemned pirate would be led out of the cart and up onto the scaffolding where the gallows awaited. The hangman would be waiting for them, usually executioners employed by the specific prison that held the pirate prior to his or her doom. Like many executions throughout history, the pirate would be given a chance to utter some last words, and would likely have been read their last rites by the chaplain who accompanied them for their journey over. It was then time for the executioners to take over. A typical execution for the average pirate would be quick, and would have been designed to be as painless as possible. A noose suspended from a long rope would be looped around the pirate's neck, who would then fall beneath the scaffolding as the executioner opened the hatch below. The resulting drop would immediately break the victim's neck, an act that would cause a quick death as the crowd cheered and the pirate faded into lost time. An eyewitness account published in the Gentleman's Magazine, which was distributed across England on the 4th of February, 1796, covered the executions of three sailors that had been accused of mutiny on board their ship, murdering their captain, and taking control of the vessel for themselves. This is what the eyewitness wrote. This morning, a little after 10 o'clock, Collie, Cole, and Blanche, the three sailors convicted of the murder of Captain Little, were brought out of Newgate and conveyed in solemn procession to Execution Dock, there to receive the punishment awarded by law. On the cart on which they rode was an elevated stage. On this were seated Collie, the principal instigator in the murder, in the middle, and his two wretched instruments, the Spaniard Blanche and the Mulatto Cole, on each side of him, and behind, on another seat, two executioners. On the way to the place of execution, they were preceded by the Marshal of the Admiralty in his carriage, the Deputy Marshal, bearing the silver oar, and the two city marshals on horseback, sheriff's officers, and more. The whole cavalcade was conducted with great solemnity. Collie seemed in a state resembling that of a man stupidly intoxicated and scarcely awake, and the two discovered little sensibility on this occasion, nor to the last moment of their existence did they, as we hear, make any confession. They were turned off about a quarter before twelve, in the midst of an immense crowd of spectators. As hard as it is to believe, this was deemed a merciful death, the best case scenario for somebody condemned to die at Executioner's Dock. On certain occasions, the executioners decided to exercise a bit more authority and violence. These occasions were reserved for particularly notorious pirates, perhaps captains, or those who had been wanted by the maritime courts for serious crimes. In such instances, the executioners would fit the gallows with a noose attached to a much shorter rope. When the lever was pulled and the trapdoors opened, the pirate would not fall far enough for their neck to be broken. This would have caused two things to happen. Firstly, the dangling body would have been in immense pain as their neck hit what would normally be the breaking point. Secondly, the person at the end of the rope would now be desperately gasping for oxygen, something that was impossible to attain. Hangings that used a short noose took a much longer amount of time for the condemned to die, and those who experienced it were seen to be violently writhing at the end of the rope. This was later dubbed the Marshal's Dance, as in an ironic and cruel twist, it looked as though the dying individual was dancing. The horrors of these more severe executions were twofold. If the grisly execution method wasn't enough, the pirates then had to die with the posthumous indignity of knowing their corpse would be displayed for all to see, usually at executioner's dock. While lesser criminals had their bodies removed after the execution, notorious pirates were left there until at least three high tides had submerged them along the coast. Only then would the partially waterlogged and desecrated body be removed from the gallows, ready for the next unlucky resident. For some, even this wasn't the end. In rare cases, the courts would deem that the bodies be hung at bends in the River Thames, typically Blackwall Point on the Greenwich Peninsula, to be used as a warning to any sailors who might attempt a life of maritime crime. The Execution of Captain William Kidd In 
By far the most famous pirate of all to be hanged at Executioner's Dock was Captain William Kidd, a pirate leader originally born in Scotland. Upon his eventual execution, he was brought to Executioner's Dock from Newgate Prison in 1701, where he would face the horrors of the hangman's short rope. As Kidd was brought before the crowd, he was read his last rites and the executioner pulled the lever to send him on his way. To the alarm of the executioner, the crowd, and Kidd himself, however, the rope failed to hold him and promptly snapped. Kidd fell to the floor, likely gasping for air as the crowd before him gasped and whispered. Some onlookers reportedly cried out that this was a sign from God himself. Kidd must be forgiven for his crimes as God clearly doesn't want him to die now. Regardless of what the crowd wanted, the executioner took no time in picking Kidd up off the floor and placing a second short rope around his neck. This time, the hangman was successful and Captain William Kidd, the man who had marauded in the waters across the West Indies and North America for over 10 years, was left to dangle as his life left his body. Following this grisly series of events, Kidd was left at the dock for three days, as was customary for those convicted of serious crimes, before he was relocated to Tilbury Point, a section of the Thames that saw frequent thoroughfare from trade and military vessels alike. His body was left there indefinitely as the waves, wind, rain, and sun battered and bruised it along the rocky shore. This must have been a terrifying sight to any sailor, let alone those who were tempted into a life of piracy. If you want to learn more about the execution of Captain William Kidd, we've just made a video on that topic the other week, so please do check it out on the channel. Make sure you subscribe to see any of the other videos that we put out every week, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, have a great week.